Dr. Pete is known for saying coffee, chocolate, sugar, ice cream are addictive because they're good for you. Obesity is not caused by overeating or excess calories. Obesity is hypothyroidism. Sugar is the only superfood. Unsaturated fats, including but not limited to fish oils and seed oils, are unhealthy and unessential. Some people eat ice cream and some don't. And they found that the ones who eat ice cream are consistently healthier. There is always some supplement coming from their food. And since 1940, that has been legally banned from the American food supply. Hello and welcome to the Rejuvenate podcast. I'm your host, Chrissy Hawks, and I'm here with my co-host, Owen Robinson. And today we are talking about the most controversial and interesting theories of Dr. Ray Pete. Now, Dr. Raymond Pete had a doctorate in biology with a specialization in physiology from the University of Oregon. Dr. Pete's specialized in studying the hormone progesterone in 1968, and along with other hormones like thyroid hormone, he has continued to study the role of progesterone and endocrinology in the body to today and all the things that are out there. So Elwin, tell me, why are we talking about this topic? Why today? Yeah, I just want to add, uh, he also served as a professor in a lot of different universities that are prestigious in the US, um, and, but he did die recently. So his study is no longer continuing. And that's part of the reason I want to do this video, actually, Chrissy. Um, ironically, and I think this often happens with people who are ahead of their time, I see his theories starting to catch on now and become trendy and even be popularized by some major um, figures in the natural health world just after he's died, unfortunately. Um, and so I wanted to uh, like talk about them for a while. I've already talked about certain aspects in previous episodes, like we talked about serotonin not necessarily being a good thing. A lot of that thinking I originally heard from uh, Dave P uh, from Ray Pete. But I also wanted to talk about um, you know a lot of his other theories, but I didn't quite know how. And I saw a tweet uh, a few weeks ago, which I shared with you, which was great that just summed up and we'll put the Twitter user below. I can't even say his name, unfortunately, or her name. I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, it's kind of one of those anonymous accounts. But they uh, very eloquently summed up into a bunch of different headlines um, his most controversial ideas, or a lot of them. Not all of them were ones that he originated, but they were all ones that he believed in. And so I thought it might be fun, because we often do very in-depth root cause kind of episodes. I thought it might be fun to do one just looking at those tweets um, and giving my commentary and understanding about them. But then as I got into it more and more, I was like, you know what? Usually, um, if it's someone other than me that's saying stuff, I'd like to hear from them themselves, which is why we like to interview people. We've only done a few so far, but I'd like to do a lot more. But in this case, he's died. So of course, we can't interview him. So I thought, what's the next best thing? So I got together some quotes, which are related to the various topics we're going to be talking about, um, that I thought uh, you could read, Chris, uh, Chrissy. And then so we'll hear from the man in his own words. And then I'll give my commentary and perspective and experience about it as well and maybe tell people where to learn more depending on what it is that we're talking about um ray p is probably the most controversial natural health figure that i've ever come across and the controversial is like there's a lot of people who like say a lot of maybe crazy things like you should fast you know like without any water for extended periods of time or you should just eat fruit or you should just eat meat i mean all of those things are pretty extreme from any normal person's perspective but the things that ray pete did i guess that was so controversial is he's made well i won't say them because then we're kind of spoiling it a little bit but he said things that were like completely against not only what the mainstream health world thinks, but a lot of time what the alternative or natural health world thinks. So when I first came across his theories, I thought that they were completely nuts. And to be honest, that's because I mainly saw the diet elements of what he recommended. And I'm still not 100% convinced, to put it mildly, about all the dietary recommendations. But as I got into it a few years ago and understood the um biological biochemical basis of what he was talking about and the especially his work on hormones which is one of the things as you mentioned earlier that he actually specialized in for a long time um as a professor at universities and all the rest of it i was actually blown away at how helpful and accurate a lot of what he said had turned out to be and there were some ideas that he had which when he first started promoting them, no one believed in, and now kind of everyone in the natural world believes in. So I feel like he deserves credit for those as well, and so we'll cover some of those today. 
Um, so yeah, it's my pleasure to be able to hopefully give some commentary on these things. And I certainly don't agree with all of them, but I want to do my best to put across where I feel he was coming from. Great, Alan. I know when you shared that tweet with me, for sure, there's things in there that I really wanted to sink our teeth into a little bit and have time for a discussion and kind of really, you know, pick them up, not pick them apart, but like just go for a deeper dive into them, let's say. So So with that, you know, I'm really looking forward to this. So uh, let's get started with the um, the first section of tweets from from that original tweet, if you like. I'll just say on that, that, you know, the one thing he did write several books, but the one easy criticism to, well there's a couple of criticisms you can easily make about ray p one of them is that he was a uh, a theoretical guy a researcher so he deeply understood the mechanisms behind things but he didn't have that experience of having a lot of patients or clients which he was responsible for um their health over extended periods of time so it's funny we just recently did an interview with dr michael platt who actually shares some similarities with dr p if you've watched the episode and you watch this one you'll see there's definitely some overlap um, but you know, with him, he's only focused on what he knows works with clients, Dr. Platt. And it, a lot of time if I ask him about the theory behind it, he's not that interested in it. So Dr. Pete was the exact opposite. So he had a lot of theoretical understanding, maybe not the same level of practical understanding. But the other thing that makes him quite impenetrable for people, and this is why I wanted to make this episode, is he didn't really have one of those classic guru books that just he never really was like prescribing this is the diet that you should follow this is the regimen that you should follow he was just sharing his experiences and understanding as he went and he experimented on himself far more than anyone a little bit like me i guess um and so there is no coherent body of work that just explains his positions on each different area much less actually gives advice so a lot of people are trying to piece it together um, and so I wanted to, yeah, help to make that more clear as well, maybe about how, um, that would apply practically. Beautiful. Well, let's do that. So the first, first subjects that are going to be here, and I'm going to be reading from my list quite a lot today is, um, what was said was SECO calories in calories out is bullshit. Pardon that. The mere existence of the thyroid disproves it. Obesity is not caused by overeating or excess calories. Obesity is hypothyroidism. As for SECO, the law of thermo thermodynamics is right. SECO is wrong because it oversimplifies so badly as to be useless. <laughs> okay. Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so what does that actually mean? So yeah. calories in, calories out. So the basic idea about, behind that is the, the idea that in order to lose weight, what you need to do is you need to burn more calories than you consume. That's what, that's what this uh, person is talking about. And I agree that it is, let's use the word nonsense. Um, and I agree that the thyroid disproves it for this simple reason. If a person has hyperthyroidism, which is relatively rare, it doesn't happen that much, but if and when they do, they can eat, never mind, three, four, five, even 10,000 calories a day and still not gain weight and possibly even lose weight. They just waste away. And so why is that? It's fairly complex, but one of the things that's simply going on is that someone with hyperthyroidism, their metabolism is going too quickly. And so if it's possible for a metabolism to go so quickly that it's impossible to even keep weight on, let alone gain it, then couldn't the opposite also be true? Couldn't it be true that a metabolism could be so low that it's impossible to lose weight, um, even on a calorie-restricted diet? You'd think so, right? And so if that's true, then the thyroid is really the best starting point. And I see a lot of people these days, they talk about metabolism and they give all kinds of advice from metabolism, but they miss the most crucial part, which is thyroid which Ray Pete did not. He, I believe, took a lot of cues from Broder Barnes, who was a doctor in the um, early 20th century that really helped to popularize and help make people aware um, how important the thyroid is. Uh, he, he wrote a book called Hypothyroidism and a, a bunch of others as well. Uh, so yeah, so that's it in a nutshell. 
Okay, yeah. So then essentially what I'm hearing is the, if they're you know within the thyroid, if it's in that hyper mode, then it doesn't matter how many calories you're eating, it's going to burn it off. And then what, what we're seeing, I think a lot, which we've discussed in other episodes, is that most of us are actually in a state of hypothyroidism where our thyroid really isn't working so well, correct? Yeah, suboptimal, suboptimal. thyroid function. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, and in fact, that leads to the first quote from Ray Pete very nicely. Yeah, let me read this here. So almost everyone benefits from adding a little bit of thyroid. The human diet historically probably always included some supplemental animal thyroid, whether it came from chicken stew or fish soup or sausages or even blood. There is always some supplement coming from their food. And since 1940, that has been legally banned from the American food supply and pretty much other industrialized countries imitating the U.S. requiring slaughterhouses to take out the thyroid glands. Yeah, so I thought this is a particularly relevant quote to understand because... If you come at people with the idea of you're probably going to be feel better, function better, function more optimally if you add thyroid gland, there's a lot of suspicion about that. You know, one of them is more, you know, people in the mainstream medical position, and that's fine. But even in the alternative world, and I think in the alternative world, it's like, well, surely, you know, unless we have a real issue, and this is really the mainstream perspective as well, unless I have a serious medical issue, then I have my body can make its own thyroid gland, right? So I thought that's a very interesting thing to perhaps understand that, and this goes along with a lot of the, the more paleo carnivore diet kind of mentality, I guess, that throughout most of our history, we have been eating quite a lot of animal foods and that we probably ate nose to tail or at least something close to it. Like this is true even in some cultures in the world right now, right? They will tend to use the whole animal rather than only the muscle meat. Um, and so, you know, uh, as he says, fish head soup and chicken soup and stuff like that. A lot of focus is given. And when you do that, then you get the collagen, you get like, um, you know, other benefits from it. But what he's pointing out, which is really interesting, is that probably most of our ancestors throughout history were supplementing thyroid, even if not intentionally. As I said, like if it was a small animal and you put the whole thing in a soup or a stew or whatever, some of the T4 and T3, which are the... Um, types of thyroid hormone will absolutely come out into the food and can you can you absorb hormones by eating them absolutely you can that's what thyroid medication consists of it's either synthetic um formulated thyroid hormone that you that you uh, orally swallow and then it gets absorbed for the digestive tract or it's a glandular version that same thing so yes you absolutely can so if you can get it from a, a thyroid glandular tablet then, of course, you can get it from the, the actual thyroid gland because it's the, the tablet is just a dried up version of that. And the actual thyroid gland was probably in most animal foods that our ancestors ate. There are some, you know, indigenous tribes and traditions and all the rest of it that would prioritize the thyroid. It'd be like one of the first things that they would go for. So this idea that, oh, my God, it's so unnatural to need thyroid support that's like beyond the pale perhaps it's actually been a part of our diet for a very very long time and you could get conspiratorial about this because in the early part of the 20th century they realized um, just how important this was and they were handing out thyroid glandular to people back then like they do ssris or even painkillers now i mean they were a lot of people were given it right and it had such a beneficial effect, as, as we talk about in more detail in my, my whole episode on thyroid, we won't go through the whole thing uh, right now. But so the interesting thing is that because of that, because it was so effective, and also because it was found to be effective before the, um, before the AMA and before the FDA and all those uh, regulatory agencies were set up, it was kind of grandfathered in as a medicine that was allowed to be sold. Anyway, this medicine was... Um, so important but then they made it a rule it can only be sold as a medicine so no one even the people right now who are selling animal glandular products which has become more popular in the last couple of years in this world none of them are allowed to include the actual thyroid hormone in any of those supplements that would be literally illegal so if you're an animal um, produce you know manufacturer you literally must make sure you remove it before you sell it to the end consumer and you must sell it to the pharmaceutical industry and then the pharmaceutical industry will sell it back to you at a vastly increased price point and only if a doctor approves it which maybe in 1940 was not so bad because doctors as i said were handing it out freely 
But then suddenly, for, again, various possibly just error or possibly conspiratorial reasons, they stopped giving it to people unless they were in the most desperate, like, most extreme version of hypothyroid possible. Perfect. That leads us to the next quote from Dr. Pete. Probably the healthy young person's gland produces about four grains of thyroid per day. Then doctors will often supply only thyroxine, only T4, and that will suppress your TSH down to zero. But you aren't necessarily getting any thyroid function, function from that because it depends on good sugar supply and selenium for your tissues to convert T4 to the active T3. Using a glandular thyroid you should think in terms of a healthy person being able to produce four grains per day. You can usually maintain a good function at two grains, but just in case symptoms show up, you shouldn't resist taking the full four grain supplement. Armor Company used to make lots of five grain tablets and veterinarians generally recognize that Cocker Spaniels often needed a five grain tablet, even though they weighed maybe 50 pounds. Lots of human patients require five grains i knew one let's just oh go ahead stop you there for a second chrissy because yeah. we keep using the word grain yeah um so grain is a measurement of um thyroid glandular and so this comes from originally like uh, um the the basically the weight of it so a thyroid grain is standardized these days to provide a very specific amount. I think I got this wrong in the previous episode, but it's nine micrograms of T3, and I think it's 36 micrograms of T4. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that that's it. So I've never given specific recommendations for how much anyone should take, and I do think it should be overseen by a medical professional, and I do think it should be based on a true understanding of blood tests. However, this quote that you're including right now, that's Dr. Pete's. Uh, perspective about how much a person should have how much they should be producing by themselves and what they might want to do to supplement that if they feel like their thyroid is not creating enough itself um, and then I think he goes into uh, a really extreme example here about <laughs> how someone could maybe even do more of that sometimes yeah um, let me carry on thank you for that explanation i was going to ask if you could give us a little definition on grain so thank you for that um so he continues i knew one woman who was very sick for about 30 years her hips were about a yard wide and she had to use a walker could barely get around she found a doctor who would prescribe five grains and she improved so much over a couple of months she went to another doctor got an additional five grains and on 10 grain supplement she was almost well she found a third doctor and taking 15 grains a day in just two or three weeks, she was totally healthy and got a job. And after about 30 years of extreme hypothyroid thyroidism, that was apparently because her liver had been poisoned so that she wasn't able to convert the T4 comp component. And with 15 grains of armor thyroid, she was really getting the equivalent of a good four grain function. Okay, so to summarize that, a woman basically committed what's possibly medical fraud because she went to three <laughs> different doctors and got a yeah. maximum dose from all of them. Um, but as a result of that, she lost a huge amount of weight, which was back to the, what the original question was. Um, and, you know, she managed to get a job for the first time. She no longer had to use a walker to get around and she was cured. I mean, that's what he's describing there. Um, and so he's describing, I guess... You need as much as you need until you get the result that you want. And this basically used to be the attitude of medical doctors, again, in the first half of the 20th century, including people like Broder Barnes, before they decided to switch stuff up and base it all on a blood test, which is probably not super accurate or helpful, which is TSH. But the importance of the thyroid goes so far beyond just losing weight and in fact he has a different quote i didn't put it in here because of time but what happened to me he had a um you know he has quotes about happened to himself and other people which is he said this especially the case of men uh that there was a bunch of them that were like weighing 120 130 pounds really really underweight couldn't hold on to muscle mass couldn't hold on to fat just emaciated and then they started taking thyroid and they started to put on muscle and fat and they started to become normal and healthy again so it actually goes both ways it's not just about weight loss although that's the thing we tend to focus on it could just as easily be about weight gain in the positive sense um, but thyroid is actually beyond that 
So Chrissy, this last quote, I remember when you first started taking thyroid and I asked you if you felt anything and you said something. Do you remember what you said? Yeah, it was where I could actually, I said, I, well, it's been a little while, but it was to the essence essentially of that I actually felt like what happy was for one of the first times. So I was like, oh, okay, hang on a minute. I kind of like this feeling. It feels good. <laughs> and it's like, uh, it's a hard thing to describe. And so that's why I wanted to add this last uh, quote from Ray Pete because I feel like it, uh, discusses this issue a little bit about that. When you hit the right dose of thyroid, and I know this is not scientific, but when you hit the right dose of thyroid for you, whatever that may be, and again, I do recommend medical supervision and testing, but when you hit that, um, what you can expect, how you know you've really hit it. Yes, he says, doctors have been thinking of euphoria as something dangerous. If thyroid leads to euphoria, they'll tell you to stop taking it because they think of those good feelings as not quite compatible with life. And the whole business of living is this background of feeling your blood circulate and energy being produced. If you ask a person to pay attention to their heart beating, they often get nervous. And first reaction when a person takes an exactly right dose of thyroid, one typical response was, thyroid is love a feeling that radiates out of the chest, all of the good feeling nuclei throughout the body, all of these are intensified by thyroid. And your heart is one of the major emotion sensors. And if you are low in thyroid, then those same areas of your body that should be sensing the pleasure of living are reporting anxiety. People feel anxiety around their heart and chest, but the right response to it, getting the right dose, the experience of love is probably the best description to what the euphoria of metabolism is doing. So that's quite profound, if true, right? There's a lot of, you know, spiritual systems that basically teach that all there is is fear and love. It's kind of a cliche, right? And I would say certainly like in your heart, I would say there's three things that you would normally feel from your heart. So either nothing, right? Because it's kind of shut down and numb. And that's the interesting comment that he made. I think most people are actually in that shutdown state where they don't feel their heart at all. And if they start to feel it, they're like nervous. The actual definition of palpitations is just that you become aware of your heartbeat. The heartbeat doesn't actually have to be going fast. It doesn't have to be erratic. It doesn't have to be skipping a beat. Just being aware of your heartbeat is considered a medical issue from a pure medical point of view. But as you said, when you feel aware of your heartbeat, a lot of the time that can be uh, anxiety. But actually, of course, it can also be love. Those most profound experiences when you're in love with someone or you're in love with the world you just feel on top of the world you also really feel your heart you feel that intense feeling in your heart um, and so I thought that was really interesting that that's a great definition of the right amount of thyroid where yes you feel alive and awake and I guess uh, a lot of the time the journey to that so when you first start taking thyroid, you might notice your heart kind of for the first time and it might well prompt anxiety. So rather than, because anxiety is kind of like a mental response to that physiological sensation. So rather than that, we want to ultimately get to a place of, yes, I feel my heart every moment, but I feel it like radiating love rather than as anxiety. No, that's definitely a good quote. And uh, yeah, thank you for that memory. Um, I have, do you have a question going back to the, uh, the previous quote, talking about the conversion of T4 to T3? Because a lot of times um, people, what he was saying is people are just prescribed the T4. Is that levothyroxine? Am I correct with that? Yeah. yeah. So then what he's saying here, and, and maybe it's that thing of like really checking if the body, the body may not be able to convert that T4. So having the actual desiccated thyroid is the better choice, correct? In many cases. Uh, in the case of selenium deficiency, yes. In the case of not enough glucose, which is a complicated subject we'll get into, Yes. And then in the case of high estrogen, mm. yes. And this is why women tend to suffer more of hypothyroidism, or at least they're aware of suffering with it and much more frequently diagnosed with it. Um, although by the time they're in their 40s, often men have just as much as women. So I think it, this is a very much underdiagnosed condition for men as well. Um, but I guess the point is even a 20-year-old woman could have a, you know, a high chance of having an issue with this, a 20-year-old man less so. Um, so estrogen blocks that conversion of T4 to T3. T3 is the active form that actually gets into your cells that maybe has all these magical effects we're talking about, making you the perfect way, making you feel in love with the world. That requires T3. And so because the body's often bad at making that conversion, is it better to just give your body some? Ray Pete certainly said yes. 
he was a big fan of giving uh, tea free quite frequently, several times a day, because your body uh, metabolizes it usually within two or three hours, um, along with some T4 as well, which is levothyroxine. A good natural way of doing that is with desiccated thyroid. Perfect, great. And then within that, just as a question that just popped up, um, would it be, because you're talking about energy, you're talking about mitochondrial function, if he's talking about taking it throughout the day, would there be a cutoff, like, but you know, don't take any <laughs> of it after 4 p.m. or something like that, whether it might have a knock-on effect with your sleep? Yeah, something like that, and absolutely, yes. Yeah, I think if you go to sleep at a normal time, like 9 or 10, then probably 4 or 5 would be a, a good cutoff time. Perfect. So, yeah, and then he, we're going to move into the next set of tw tweets. We've kind of blocked a few of them together to, um, for to be concise. And this one I was very interested in because I wanted some more distinctions from you on um, on the word sugar because there's so many different definitions of sugar, whether it's refined, whether it's fruit, whether it's your complex carbs, all this. So here are the few quotes or the tweets that we put together here. Sugar is the only superfood. Burning sugar is far superior to burning fat. Keto is a death diet. So Ellen, let's dig into these. <laughs> very controversial i don't agree with this 100 percent. i do think it varies depending on um genetics for instance that's one of the things that we do in genetic insights one of the reports is on carbohydrates and it tells you whether you're genetically more likely to do well with higher or lower carbohydrates and whether you do well with simple or not carbohydrates but anyway let's give ray pete's perspective as i understand it and what i've got a lot of quotes for this one because i want to again it's such a controversial perspective we want to hear it from the man himself. Uh, but I think I need to explain something else first, which is the whole philosophy of what Ray Pete was teaching. In a nutshell, I'll do my very best. I'm sorry, Ray Pete fans, that this, if this doesn't, you know, if this falls short of uh, what your idea would be. But the ideal position for health is to have a good, strong, fast, but not too fast metabolism. That's what you find in people in a position of youthful vitality and health. That's what is most desirable. That was his perspective. The thing um, that both destroys a good metabolism and also is usually a substitute for a good metabolism is the stress hormones. So from his perspective, and I guess in a way, even from a mainstream medical perspective, you can either be in a position where your metabolism is strong, providing all the energy you need, or you can be in a position where stress is making up that deficiency for a lack of metabolism. Or I guess the third option is that you can be in a state of complete collapse because neither of those systems are working well. And so this is something that I had been in a way teaching for over 10 years because you know the Taoist perspective on that is that you have something called qi, which they, I translate as everyday energy, and then Jing, which is like your reserve adrenal energy. And so there's this idea in Chinese medicine that you need enough qi, you need enough like everyday energy, and if you don't have that, then you have to use your backup, which is finite. So this actually correlates very well with the Western perspective and what Dr. Pete teaches about how if your body is... Um, producing ATP, which is cellular energy, which I'd say is the equivalent of chi, in a um, economical way, in an optimal way, which is uh, an aerobic way for the sake of uh, simplicity, it's, it's an oxygen uh, dependent way, then you are getting a lot of ATP for every unit of food and you're good. If that process is not working correctly for whatever reason, and the whatever reason is very complicated, if it's not working correctly, then you're going to need a backup supply of energy. And so there's other ways of getting energy from burning fat, from burning, from turning fat into sugar, from turning protein into sugar, for converting sugar into energy, but without oxygen, which are much less efficient, still give you energy but they're much less efficient, they don't give you as much energy, and they rely on the stress chemicals being high to achieve it. And so from his perspective, burning fat for fuel, I think that was one of the, the uh, tweets, right? Um, burning fat is superior to, burning sugar is superior to burning fat. So burning fat is like a backup system. 
if the sugar one isn't working correctly. Um, because it is the sugar one that produces the um, largest amount of energy per unit. Now, there is also ketone bodies, which it, they are also good. MCTs and ketone bodies, they are also an efficient producer of energy. So it's not to say that um, fat is always a bad way of getting energy, but he talks about a specific type of fat, which I think will come up in these quotes, which is the much more common type of fat that is utilized and turned into energy. And when your body does it that way, it's dependent on stress chemicals and it is very inefficient and it's going to leave you in a very depleted state and it's going to run you down and it's going to age you prematurely and it's going to leave you low in energy. It's going to suppress your thyroid function. It sets up a whole chain of reactions where you have a lot of other things going on you don't want, which lead to weight gain, disease, accelerated aging, and all the rest of it. And from his point of view, all of that starts from not having enough sugar and not being able to convert that sugar correctly into ATP, which is what you actually want. And so when he says sugar, he's not talking about white sugar, white table of sugar, and yet he is. <laughs> in some cases, right. he was a big fan of white sugar. And I put a couple of quotes in here about from him where he talks about it absolutely healing people. Um, but his preferred source of sugar actually in practice was from fruit. He was a big fan of uh, getting a lot of calories from fruit. Um, and he also got sugar. He was a big fan of milk. So we get a lot of uh, uh, sugar from dairy as well in the form of lactose. So lactose, fructose, glucose, sucrose, those are his preferred methods. But he was absolutely happy with, um, you know, getting, uh, using refined sugar um, in a way that I guess even the mainstream kind of is on board with. And, um, you know, maybe a lot of athletes are, right? Like generally these days carbs almost seem like a bad thing by a lot of the community and yet you know a lot of athletes are using dextrose right which is just uh, uh um pure glucose so uh, it's not always that simple but yeah let's go into his first quote absolutely here we go sugar is my current understanding of what is most protective against stress stress tends to increase your circulating free fatty acids activating the randall effect Blocking the ability to use sugar for energy and increasing the sugar in your diet tends to lower the lipo lipolytic activity, keeps the fat where it belongs, and prevents the Randall shift to fat oxidation. And so it maximizes your carbon dioxide production, which keeps your stress-producing lactic acid inhibited. All right, can you break that whole down, the whole thing down for us? <laughs> yeah, there's a lot in there. Yeah. Um, so first of all, the whole thing, and we're filming the episode on insulin resistance really soon, which I'll break this down into a lot more detail. But in a nutshell, um, I would say Ray P actually agreed that insulin resistance was the cause of a lot of issues. But just as many in the mainstream to some degree now, and definitely on the alternative health scene, insulin resistance is getting really big. And it's they're, they're right. It is a precursor or correlates with almost every disease. It is a major issue. The general way of dealing with that, though, is just to reduce carbs as much as possible. So Ray Pete is saying that is the opposite of what you want to do. He says that the reason why your body gets um, insulin um, resistant is because of free fatty acids. So free unbound units of fat floating around in your bloodstream, which block the ability of insulin to get into the cell. So that's what you meant by blocking the ability to use sugar for energy. Um, and then he says, increasing your sugar in your diet tends to lower the lipolytic, lipolytic activity. So what does that mean? It means when you increase your sugar, your body will pull less fat out of storage as an emergency backup uh, energy source. Now, again, almost everyone is going to, reading this is like, well, why would I want that? I want my body to pull fat out of storage as a, as a backup source because I want to have less fat in my body, right? But the problem was, from his perspective, when you do that, you are blocking your body's ability to utilize glucose, which over time will mean that you're not enough able to produce enough ATP from energy, which over time will mean that you're going to be running on stress hormones all the time, which means that your estrogen will go up, your insulin will go up, and your thyroid will go down. And that goes back to the first point that we did, uh, which was 
calories in and calories out is not accurate. So if your insulin is far too high, if your estrogen is far too high, and your thyroid is far too low, you can consume an amount of calories that would not make me put on weight or you put on weight, Chrissy, and it would make you put on loads of weight because it's the hormonal situation. So what you're saying is by restricting sugar and trying to get your body to burn fat as fuel, what you're actually doing is blocking your body's ability to produce energy properly, which creates this chain reaction, which makes you end up in this position where um, you're running on stress, you're low on energy, you have disease forming, and you can't get out of it anymore because you've blocked your body's ability to utilize glucose, which to him was, you know, the superior fuel. I think there's also, and we recorded this episode just a little bit ago on hypoglycemia, talking about having the correct macros, a little bit of protein with a little bit of fat with your carbohydrates and getting that, that very well um, worked out so that the body is being provided with all that it needs so that it can, can optimize what it needs to use at the right time, correct? Uh, yes, correct. And one of the things that he focused on, and we'll get uh, get onto it in a second section, is the the quality of the fat is absolutely key. So, as I said, with MCTs and ketone bodies, he was not against that at all. That's great. That's not a free fatty acid. That's not going to block your body's ability to utilize glucose efficiently and produce plenty of ATP. It's the other type of fats. Yeah. Can you list a few a few of those, or just give us a quick example of a couple? The unsaturated fats, you know, so for instance, as well known these days, omega-6 fatty acids. And even in the, um, I would say that's one of the few things that the kind of repeat type of community versus the keto community can agree on, um, or the insulin resistant keto community can agree on, is that omega-6 fats are bad news and that they make insulin resistance worse, they make it harder to lose weight, they slow down the metabolism. So that's one of the few points that they actually both agree on. Great. Thank you for that distinction. Um, so then going into his next quote, uh, Dr. Pete said, I think sucrose has great virtues therapeutically. I've heard stories about fatally apparently injured animals and people who are in the hospital with hopeless symptoms being given a mouthful. In the case of an animal in shock, they would pour a mouthful of honey in its mouth and hold its mouth shut. And in a few min minutes, the animal would be up, not dying at all. And that has happened to dogs and sheep and ducks and all sorts of animals, as well as patients who are in the hospital in a hopeless condition. Someone slipped them a jar of honey and gave him a tablespoon of it and the symptoms disappeared. And dozens and dozens of stories like that convinced me that in an emergency of almost any sort, a good big dose of sucrose is very important. So this is a great one to explain, you know, the first week we said, which is sugar is the only superfood. I mean, that sounds like a crazy thing to say on the face of it. Because, you know, I mean, where does the term superfood comes from? It generally refers to something that's nutritionally dense. So it's got like a lot of nutrients. That's the original people who said, you know, blueberries or chocolate or whatever were superfoods because they got loads of these other nutrients along with the calories. Even broccoli, right? Broccoli's got almost no calories, but it's got a bunch of other stuff in it. So, however, I don't think broccoli or blueberries have ever revived someone dying in hospital. And I guess that's kind of his point. Um, that, like, literally, uh, it can save your life to get that pure glucose if and when you need it. What's more super than that? I guess that was his position. And... Yes, white sugar obviously isn't nutritionally dense. Uh, I think technically you could make a case that like a molasses sugar, like a very dark brown sugar, actually is quite nutritionally dense. It's got quite a lot of uh, minerals and um, you know nutrients in there, B vitamins and stuff as well. So, uh, but yeah, so that's really his justification for it being a superfood because it can literally save your life. Beautiful. He also goes on to say, Mostly fruits do contain sucrose, but a lot of them contain some free fructose and free glucose, as well as other minor sugars. But sucrose in fruits, the main advantage is that it comes with lots of antioxidants, anti-stress factors, anti-inflammatory flavonoids, for example, and potassium and magnesium. So it's part of a very complex, valuable nutrient, even with quite a
quite a bit of like 1% amino acids that can um, amino acids that can add to your protein balance. But if you're getting good nutrition, then where a person would think nothing of eating a bowl of white rice or a potato, which contains lots of starch, the idea of getting a similar amount of calories from white sugar has been demonized. But if your nutrition is generally good, there's nothing wrong with white sugar. In fact, it's very low in allergens, so it can lower your cortisol when you're under stress. So it has many protective effects. <laughs> okay, so there's a couple of things to unpack there as well. Um, so first of all, as I said, I think fruit he preferred because of all the other great stuff that came with it. It was more nutritionally dense uh, from his point of view. But he po he's pointing out that, and this is something that diabetics know, that a bowl of white rice or like a baked potato actually has a significantly higher glycemic impact and therefore, you know, glycemic load than an equivalent amount of calories coming from sugar. And yet people would easily eat a baked potato or a bowl of rice. You know, I mean, in, in Asia, yeah, it's pretty much a bowl of rice of every meal <laughs> from what I observed. Uh, it's pretty standard. Like that's nothing. But if you saw uh, a person eating like a bowl of sugar with their meal, you'd be like, what on earth are you doing? Right. Or even after the meal is dessert or whatever, it would seem crazy. And yet glycemically, it's not more impactful. Right. Um, and so what he says, if your nutrition is generally good, there's nothing wrong with white sugar. I think what he means by that is, you know, sugar does require nutrients in order to metabolize. Thiamine, vitamin B1, which we've talked about a lot, magnesium, all kinds of nutrients. So the, the only problem with white sugar is it doesn't have any of those nutrients in it. That's from his perspective, right? But if you're getting an abundance of those nutrients from other sources, to throw in some white sugar is certainly no worse. In fact, from his perspective, better. It's better than white rice. It's got a lower glycemic index. He's got complicated views on why sucrose is better than um, starch. Uh, which probably we'll, we'll do in another video at some point. Um, but yeah, so that's why it says white sugar, it's been unfairly demonized. And the other thing he says about it, so yes, a disadvantage has got no nutrients, but an advantage is it has no allergens. And so one of the big things that ruins your health that he talks about as well is the gut. The gut, um, both in terms of actual toxins going in there, but also things that your body's having an immune response to as if they're toxins. And so lowering that inflammation in the gut is a key aspect to getting that stress response down, which then gets all of the other hormones in a good place and all the rest of it. So it is a key aspect to all this. And if you're eating large amounts of a calorie source that your body also has an allergic response to, that's going to stop you getting better, even if you're doing everything else right. So again, from his perspective, white sugar, it's got no allergens in and it's a perfect fuel. So again, that's why his perspective, it would be a superfood, even though it's not nutritionally dense with uh, any micronutrients. Yeah, it's a, definitely white sugar, you know, has gotten a bad rap <laughs> for sure. <laughs> um, it, you hear so much that it's one way, like we're hearing Dr. Pete's perspective here, um, and then a, a lot of other things that are out there. So it's hard to figure out who's right. You know, I think that's a quandary of today. There's so much information saying both, both for an argument for both things, whether it's good, whether it's bad. That's a, that's a difficult space to be in. How are people supposed to, how can they figure it out? Well, as I said, genetics is one thing. So if you are more of a hunter-gatherer genetics, you're definitely going to have more of an issue with refined, relatively simple sugars. You probably, as Dr. Pete points out, you probably also have issues with baked potato, to, you know, to the same degree, because it's also uh, got a high glycemic in impact. So that's one thing. Uh, another thing is that sugar is absolutely bad for the teeth because it is a, it's such a good food from Dr. Pete's perspective. It's a good food for bacteria as well. His perspective, I guess, would be that there shouldn't be bacteria in the small intestine, and he actually would recommend antibiotics and other strategies to get rid of them, and the sugar is absorbed way before it reaches the large intestine. So the fact that it feeds bacteria would not be an issue for him because he would advise basically um, nuking any area of the body <laughs> uh, of any organisms that the sugar might reach. Now, the exception to that is the mouth, right? So the mouth, you can have some bacteria and... Uh, the sugar is going to feed it. So if nothing else, sugar is definitely not great for your teeth. Um, and as a lot of people do not have a pristine, you know, pathogen-free small intestine area, 
it can create a lot more issues besides. And so I think that's another reason why it not, might not be a good idea. And it's very easy to overdo it. So one of the criticisms of people who do the repeat diet is that um, a lot of them end up overweight. Now, obviously, if your whole goal is to not allow any fat to be liberated and burnt as fuel, it's hardly surprising that that could happen. And yet it's not inevitable. And certainly Dr. P was an example of that. He was never overweight. So the resolution, but the, the thing is, so one of the benefits of being on an extreme diet, whether it's an extreme, say, fruitarian diet, where you're only carbs, no fat at all, or whether you're on like a keto diet, where it's pretty much all car uh, calories coming from fat, no, hardly any carbs at all, is that it's very hard to overeat on either of those diets. It's very hard to eat more than 2,000 calories worth of fat. It's very hard to eat more than 2,000 calories worth of carbohydrates. Um, but if you have both, it's so easy to eat a lot of calories of both if you're having both and so you know he did recommend both although he recommend lower ish fat depending on the situation um and so from my perspective it's like if you're having a lot of protein which he did also generally recommend um and you're having the right kind of fat with your meal um then are you still going to be able to overeat it it's possible but you're less likely to but that really is the key thing it's restraint the other thing is i see a lot of people and this is a really tricky thing so i see a lot of people act as if they already have a optimal metabolism in terms of how they eat so white sugar is something that may be optimal for you if you have an optimal metabolism now Ray Pete's argument is even if you don't have an optimal metabolism, it can help you get there. And the quotes we just gave are examples of that, right? People dying or animals dying, and it's still very helpful. However, if you don't have an optimal metabolism and then you freely eat as much sugar as you want, and that could be in the form of fruit and all the rest, and you allow yourself saturated fat, which he was a fan of, and you, you know, you're not necessarily focusing on having a huge amount of protein, it's going to be really, really easy to overdo it. And so I think that is one of the challenges. Um, so, however, from his perspective, if you are not doing all that, and you're just trying to get your body to burn fat, you're going keto, right, then you are kind of managing the situation, but what you're doing is you're putting your body in a situation, first of all, it tends to deplete electrolytes. I think even a lot of keto people acknowledge that, which is why they sometimes recommend supplementing with them. Second of all, in order to stay in that state of burning fat as fuel, you have to have high stress chemicals. Mm. High stress chemicals over time, over months, years and decades, absolutely are depleting and prematurely aging. They also make issues like estrogen, dominance and insulin resistance worse which are other factors that lead to premature aging they absolutely call you know contribute to systemic inflammation which can lead to premature aging so it's tricky if you keep yourself in that fat burning state it will often help to keep the weight off which is a good predictor of longevity and stuff like that which is a good thing the muscle to fat ratio is a, one of the best predictors of longevity but it has all those other bad points, which I just mentioned. If you go to a starting to have a lot of glucose and, and sucrose and fructose and stuff like that instead, you have to be really careful when you do it and how you do it to make sure you're not overdoing it, to make sure you're not creating a different issue, to make sure. And I think a lot of people, they're happier to eat like the high calorie sugar diet and not as keen to deal with the hormones. And so I think it is the other way around. I would look at all Dr. Pete's work on hormone optimization first, get the hormones in as good as, this is my personal opinion, get the hormones in as good a state as possible um, without making major changes to the diet. Let's say if you're used to having keto or whatever, and then consider, hmm, maybe I could actually, and in this, I think maybe I could actually increase, you know, the amount of carbs I'm having. And I think that would come really naturally anyway, as you're becoming healthier and healthier, as your metabolism is getting stronger and stronger, as your thyroid hormones going up, your insulin is going down, your estrogen is going down, your cortisol is going down. As all of that, your uh, progesterone, testosterone are going up, maybe all those things because you're making it happen, because you're supplementing, maybe it's just happening naturally. As you do all of that, then maybe 
you can follow his dietary advice and it'll actually benefit you and it won't make you gain weight. Perfect. Yeah, there's a lot to unpack here. Um, he's going to carry on here within this uh, talking a little bit more. Um, the most common cause for high glucose is stress causing unopposed cortisol secretion. So if you don't measure for either insulin or cortisol, you might be doing exactly the wrong treatment to lower cortisol. Sugar is the most powerful treatment. And two doctors in France and England in the late 19th century were running terminal diabetic patients. They would eat a normal meal, lots of protein, for example, but their muscles were wasting away even when they didn't eat sugar. They would eat steak, for example, it would show up in their urine as very high glucose and their body was disappearing week by week. When they fed them 12 ounces a day of ordinary white sugar as well as a standard as well as a standard meat and potatoes diet, they recovered. So how do we explain that? Uh, yeah, it's uh, you know another example um, of what I was talking about about how so in this case he's talking about, a type of diabetes which is not type 2 diabetes as we currently know it. So he said the original diabetes was actually a thing that your body doesn't have insulin and so therefore it can't transport glucose into the cell. It turns glucose into energy very inefficiently and basically you're wasting away. That was like the original diabetes. Um, and so he's saying with that one, by just giving them the, the fuel that they need in the form of this uh, you know, readily available sugar, these people were actually able to recover. Obviously, with what's called diabetes these days, type 2 diabetes is a bit of a different situation where the person is accumulating more and more fat usually. They're not wasting away at all. And so that's a bit of a different situation, and having that much sugar is not necessarily going to help with that type 2 insulin diabetes, uh, insulin-resistant diabetes in the same way. But it, it's I, I put it in there because it's just another example of why he thinks that sugar is a superfood because it can literally cure people who are dying as he says you know and has done many many different contexts oh and i do have one question um on on this topic before we move on to the next section which is the role of the liver in um sugar metabolism and things like that um and just like if there's any kind of if let's say the liver isn't functioning properly because i always I'm, I'm a little uh, confused on what that process is and the role the liver does play on sugar metabolism and potentially if there are, are any kind of, if the liver's not optimal, not you know operating correctly, whether that can also lead to weight gain in this whole process of everything that the body does when it's working with sugar. 100% it does. This is an incredibly complicated one to go into. So I don't think we want to do it in this episode. Um, but yeah, the hormone is responsible for making and transforming all kinds of different hormones, the, including insulin, uh, to some degree, though, of course, it's, it's made in the pancreas, but um, it's absolutely involved in its utilization. Um, it's obviously where the place where the body stores glycogen, but I think the main way that it's impactful is because one of the main things that starts this whole process of dysfunction is actually poisoning. It's an excess of toxicity more than the liver is able to handle in that moment. Ray Pete very specifically focuses on uh, unsaturated fats as probably the biggest culprit in poison that lead to a lot of these issues that the liver struggles to be able to deal with. Um, but, you know, all kinds of other poisons exist as well that will have that same impact. And the poison messes with the hormones. And then when the hormones are out of balance, um, everything else starts to go wrong. But yeah, it's really complex, Chrissy. I think we should do another episode. We're gonna take a quick break to share with you one of our amazing sponsors, Genetic Insights. What makes Genetic Insights uniquely valuable is that they test over 83 million different variants, which guarantees a 99.7% accuracy on all of their DNA reports. With over 100 reports available, you get comprehensive insights into what your DNA is telling you about how to optimize your health today and in the future. I found reviewing my results to be incredibly accurate and applying some of the recommendations which are personalized to your individual DNA to be extremely helpful for me and my family. I also loved how easy it was to upload my raw DNA data that I already had from previously using Ancestry.com because Genetic Insights supports uploading raw data from all major platforms. 
To get your health reports, go to geneticinsights.co and get 20% off today by using coupon code rejuvenate. Remember that supporting our sponsors supports our podcast, which allows us to keep sharing this important information with you free of cost. So go get your Genetic Insights health reports by going to geneticinsights.co and use coupon code rejuvenate for 20% off today. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, so <laughs> moving on to the next little section from the, um, from those, uh, from that, that link you sent me originally. So there's a few in here together. Um, human body temperatures have gone down drastically in just the last few generations. High metabolism increases nutritional requirements, but it also increases health and longevity if nutritional requirements are met. You can increase your metabolism with highly nutritious food and sugar. Yeah, so I want to get uh, Ray Pete's quotes on this because I think they're fantastic. But what is metabolism? Metabolism is basically the process um, whereby your body turns matter into energy, where it turns fuel into actual energy. And so a, a good metabolism, a strong metabolism, a fast metabolism is basically where all the extremely complex chemical, biochemical processes that make that happen are functioning optimally and they're functioning quickly. And when that happens, one of the telltale signs of it is that a person tends to be warmer because of this thing called mitochondrial uncoupling, which is basically when a cell has a certain amount of energy of ATP, it, and this is a simplification, but then it decides, you know, that's good, that's a good amount. Now, what we'll do is we'll produce heat instead, um, or we'll produce extra heat or put it will mainly go into heat and so um when we have a fast metabolism we tend to be warmer um and our heart rate tends to be higher and we tend to have energy now all of this goes totally against a certain strain of uh what's what's maybe some degree in the mainstream but also definitely the alternative health world which is this idea that a slow metabolism is better especially for longevity and it comes from a mechanistic idea of human beings that we're like robots you know uh, like if you buy a, a a machine it has a certain lifespan that they're usually based on um you know the amount of hours of use or whatever but there's this you know belief that well there's this understanding with a machine that let's say if i have a machine that i'm only meant to use you know and half an hour a day like a vacuum cleaner and then i'm using it all day like eight hours a day 12 hours a day it's going to break more quickly why because it's only got a certain amount of hours of use in and then it's going to break so there's this idea that the human being is the same thing that we've only got a certain amount of energy generating capacity in us we've only got a certain amount of heartbeats in us that's the, probably the most explicit example of this idea and so if we can slow our metabolism if we can cool ourselves down if we can slow our heart rate then we're going to eke out the heartbeats that we've got and we're going to make them last longer it's like a saving strategy for health or life the one challenge with that from a Ray P perspective, of course, is that it's nonsense. It's based on the idea that a human being is a, phys a thing, right? An object, as opposed to a living energetic process, which is, you know, bioenergetic is actually one of the words that's described to, uh, you know, what he taught. Um, generative energy is one of his books. So it was about energy. We're fundamentally energetic beings. That was his perspective, as well as the perspective of, you know, many great uh, wise people throughout the ages not a physical robot thing which is going to run out and run out of energy and, and fall apart and break and so from that perspective actually every cell in your body every system in your body your glands your heart your brain all the rest of it it needs energy the more energy it has available to it the better it will function the less energy it has available to it the less well it will function and so reducing the amount of energy that we create is not a beneficial thing. Even if it's true, hypothetically, I don't think it is. Even if it's true that you're only, you only get a certain amount of high heartbeats in your life. And so, you know, there's that. The other side of the coin is, okay, but it's this idea of, you know, would you rather live a day as a, as a lion or a week as a sheep? Like, 
Would you rather be, you know, meagerly eking out existence at a very low level operation? Or would you rather be, be living in an enjoyable way? And so um, I don't think that that's a real choice. I think actually it's both, but that's my opinion. That's not proven. But let's say that everyone's right and that is the choice you have to make. Would you rather every system of your body and every organ, every gland and your skin and everything was functioning at the highest energetic level, but it didn't last quite as long? Or would you rather it lasted longer, but the whole time it's kind of barely getting by because it's barely got enough energy and you've got to keep stoking stress chemicals in order to get enough energy because it's not got enough energy. It's like, what's your preferred strategy? Yeah, great, great, great question. Um, so he's gonna say a little bit more here on metabolism, but it's um, just you you had mentioned something and it was that thing about the amount of energy that you and I have either discussed in a previous episode or just together as well, that when your body doesn't have enough energy to let's say clean house and get rid of the toxicity, then things are just not gonna work very optimally. And as it begins to increase, that's when it does start to clean house so that the body can then start to function actually how we really want it to function. But um, let me get into what Dr. Pete said. He said, waking up with say a 98 degree temperature and 70 beats per minute. By about 11 in the morning, it should rise about half a degree from the waking temperature. Check the situation check the situation changes. If your night is very stressful, some people will wake up with a 98.6 temperature and a 75 beats per minute heart rate. And then after they start having orange juice and milk and sunlight, their temperature will go down to maybe 97 and a 60 beat per minute because the nighttime stress can give you artificially increased metabolism at waking. So it's important to look at the change. It should rise, your metabolic rate should rise after breakfast and stay there till sunset. Yeah, so, this is based on, um, I'd say the work of Broder Barnes, although repeat really, you know, talked about it as well. And it's basically that the best way of measuring metabolism is simply with temperature, right? This gets a little bit more tricky for women, unfortunately, because of their monthly menstrual cycles. Um, but you can still do it, just be aware that your menstrual cycle has affected it to some degree. But it's basically the idea that when you wake up, you should be about 98, as he says, about 70 beats a minute. Um, and then once you've had breakfast and by about midday, you know, it should be 98.6, about 75-ish, even 80 or, or 90, I believe he thought was fine as well. Um, now, what he's talking about there, the example of how with some people goes lower is this. The problem with the signs of a high metabolism and the reason they're not often associated with health or they're often associated with bad health is this. You can also have a high temperature and you can also have a high heart rate because of stress chemicals. And in fact, because of the state of the health of humanity in this day and age metabolically, if you do have a high temperature, relatively high, you know, let's say 98 point something, and you do have a high heart rate resting, let's say 80-ish, then it's probably because of stress chemicals. It's probably not because you're in a position of optimal health. And so he's saying that a great way of testing that is to have, you know, what he considered a healthy meal and then watch to see what happens. If you're running on stress chemicals, then you'll see the temperature will go down and the heartbeats will go down because eating will generally calm people down. That's one of the reasons why people overeat because they're stressed and they don't know what to do about it. So they just keep eating. And eventually enough of the blood supply will, will go to the digestive tract away from you know, the muscles and the heart and stuff. And they will actually start to relax. Yeah, that makes sense. Absolutely. It's, um, I know that that's part of, you know, something I need to, or that for just as checking, which is uh, have the thermometer there first thing in the morning so I can check the temperature. And, and yeah, it's a good metric. So I'll, I'll pick that up. <laughs> it is, and it's especially helpful for people who are taking thyroid supplementation from his point of view and from the traditional kind of Broder Barnes point of view that that's really what you want to be basing it on from their perspective. They didn't really believe in blood tests. They were, well, Broder Barnes, it wasn't available. Ray Pete didn't really believe in them. His perspective was um, it's all about that metabolism and the best way to measure it is the way I just said, right? With, with the way he just said as well, with the temperature and with the heart rate, but checking to make sure it's not stress by 
observing what happens to it after you eat. Well, now we're going to lead into the unsaturated fats here. And the, um, the lines here are unsaturated fats, including but not limited to fish oils and seed oils are unhealthy and unessential. Saturated fats are healthy and essential. Yeah, so part of this is not controversial anymore, but part of it is still very controversial. So I believe Ray Pete was one of the first people to really strongly um, promote the idea that seed oils are not good for you. He was doing that back in the 80s and I think even before that, which is where there was this big push to get everyone to switch to seed oils from uh, saturated fat, animal sourced fat like uh, tallow, lard, and butter, which is what had predominantly been used as a fat source before that. And then it was all about heart-healthy margarine and stuff like that. For people our age, Chris, you're probably just about old enough to remember that. Um, for if you're younger than us, then maybe you don't remember when that switch occurred. So unsaturated fats. So these days, it's kind of understood by most people in the natural alternative health world that omega-6 fats, generally also referred to as seed oils, are not good. Um, I mentioned in the previous section that it's one of the few things that the kind of Ray Pete versus keto camps can both agree on, even though they completely disagree on what source of calories is better, whether it's fats or sugars. One thing they can agree on is that the one of the worst things that you can do is have a lot of omega-6 fatty acids. Um, they are pro-inflammatory, um, and they cause a lot of problems. I've got some quotes from Pete, so he can address that correctly in a second. What he said that is definitely more controversial to anyone other than a follower of Ray Pete, pretty much. I, I really have not seen anyone else say this, that omega-3 fats are also detrimental and not beneficial, and in fact, even more detrimental than the omega-6 fats, uh, because they are in fact more unsaturated and therefore have more of all the problems that come from being unsaturated. I have a kind of potential resolution to like square that with the, you know, the fact that there are so many studies showing that omega-3 fats are beneficial, but I'll get into that in a sec. I'd like to do the quote. The whole concept of essential fatty acids, which was disproved in Texas in 1946, it was brought back in the 1950s when the food oil industry found they had lots of. It was a byproduct of the cotton industry, and they were polluting the country with the waste cottonseed, and they found that they could extract the oil, make people eat it as a food, lubricant basically. There was a great campaign around 1950 to sell Wesson oil, cottonseed oil, as they gave recipes for making spe special pastries and cakes using that instead of butter so it was all an advertising ploy in the 1950s and people accepted the advertising and people grew up believing in the essential fatty acid concept so when they went to medical school and did research it became the official doctrine and by the 1960s people were already being poisoned by eating their cottonseed oil and so soy oil and so on the medical industry had convinced itself that there was such a thing as essential fatty acids and that they were protective was the advertising line. They would protect you against cholesterol and saturated fats, and so they put several hundred veterans in Los Angeles on a diet with only the vegetable polyunsaturated fats or a fairly normal diet containing some butter and cream and lard and so on. Not really a saturated fat, but just an average diet. At the end of eight years, there were three times as many cancer deaths in the group on vegetable oil as on the normal diet. And so they stopped the study and said, well, it doesn't protect against heart disease, so we'll stop. But they didn't advertise the fact that it greatly increased the cancer mortality, which had been known in animal studies. But already, the medical industry fell for the food oil advertising line. Yeah, so that quote is really explaining the history of it. And that's the thing, like, Ray Pete had been around for a long time, so he'd actually seen all of that, right? Um, that whole process. And so it's interesting when, like, when you're your age and our, my age, Chrissy, when you just grew up and that was always believed from the moment that we were around, but he was around at a time before that was believed. And he saw that belief come into prominence as being the, um, the guiding doctrine and he couldn't believe his ears because as far as he was concerned, it had already been disproven. I just picked one example there where he tells a story about how, you know, they gave 
either vegetable oils or animal fats to people and the ones with vegetable oils were like way less healthy um the, I haven't included too many quotes from him. I've only included one about the mechanism of how unsaturated fats are bad because honestly, it could fill a whole book. Like there are so many ways that unsaturated fats are um, potentially damaging. I think one of the things to, but I'll do my best to explain it in succinct way as possible. So the difference between a saturated fat and unsaturated fat from a purely practical point of view is what temperature they solidify at, right? And so, you know, like a, a butter or a coconut oil or a lard might be solid at room temperature, right? Whereas, say, a fish oil might be liquid even when it's in a fridge. So basically, the more unsaturated it is, the colder you have to get before it becomes hard, right? The more saturated it is, the warmer it can be before it finally... Um, become soft going the other direction so why does that matter so from his point of view it's this from what i understand so saturated fat is always better from his point of view because it is less liable to be destroyed by oxidation now when it is destroyed by oxidization uh, what happens is that it becomes more inflammatory it becomes more irritating to the whole system now you might say well if that's the case why is there such a thing as unsaturated fats and it, this is the theory that i understood that when so let's say a fish we're talking about fish oil being you know omega-3 fats mainly so which is the most unsaturated type of fat a fish oil a, a fish swimming around often in cold climates if fish if fish's oil was composed of fat as saturated as, say, butter or coconut oil, then what would happen to that fish when they got into cold water? They would literally solidify, right? Like they, they would they would rid it up, they would so, uh, solidify up. So animals that don't have a fast metabolism, that don't create their own body heat, basically, have to have a more unsaturated type of fat because their temperature their body temperature can get low enough for that fat to solidify otherwise right so that's the thinking behind it now we should be keeping our temperature around you know 37 centigrade 98 fahrenheit and so we don't need that unsaturated fat because the fat inside us is never going to get that cold so it's not an issue and so the only downside of having too saturated fat is that it solidifies at too low a temperature. How do I put it? It solidifies um, too easily. Let's put it that way. Um, and so that's the thinking behind it in a nutshell. So unsaturated fat, from his perspective, worse in every way, very easily destroyed, and then very easily damaging to every system of the body. And the next quote will give an example of that. But the only reason you want it to be unsaturated is because of the temperature issue. Now, the other thing is, of course, it's the temperature that destroys the unsaturated fat. So that's the other way of looking at it. If you're a fish floating around the sea and it's only whatever, 40 Fahrenheit, 5 centigrade, the amount of damage, oxidative damage happening to that unsaturated fat inside you is fairly minor. But if you are a human being of a 37 or 98 uh, temperature, then the amount of damage that's being done to that unsaturated fat is significantly higher. So not only do we not need the unsaturated fat because we can keep the saturated fat melted, but that saturated fat is being destroyed just by being in our body. There's all this kind of focus about, you know, not to cook with, uh, you know, seed oils or olive oils and the rest of it because the fat gets damaged by heat, which is true. But from a purely you know accurate perspective it is true to say it's being un it's being damaged just by being in our body and so that's the bit that no one's talking about especially when it comes to uh when it comes to uh, omega-3 fats yeah so dr pete goes on to say a great series of studies in france looked at the effect on the thyroid hormone they had noticed that the me metabolic rate slowed down in proportion to how much unsaturated fat a person was eating and so just that right there would explain why dr pete would not like unsaturated fat 
as I explained in the previous section, from his perspective, it's all about getting the metabolism as fast and well-functioning as possible. So literally, and I don't think this is questioned anywhere that unsaturated fats slow down metabolism. But as we talked about with the metabolism, some people think it's good to slow down metabolism, right? But if that's not your perspective, if you believe that creating more energy is good rather than slowing things down, then the more unsaturated fats you have, the more it's slowing that down. He carries on, so they not only are easily stored in our fat, but they slow our ability to oxidize and get rid of fat. And the French were wondering what the mechanisms are that cause our metabolic rate to slow down in proportion of how much fish oil or seed oil is present. And they found that the enzymes that produce a thyroid hormone in the thyroid gland are blocked in proportion to how many double bonds are in the fatty acids that they are exposed to. And then once the hormone gets into the bloodstream, the protein that carries thyroid hormone throughout the body is inhibited from carrying and delivering the thyroid hormone in proportion to the number of double bonds. And once some of it gets delivered to these cells where it's going to be active, if the cells contain polyunsaturated fats, their ability to respond to the thyroid hormone is blocked exactly in proportion to the number of double bonds in the molecule. Okay, and so basically, very simply, the way that polyunsaturated fats or unsaturated fats in general slow down metabolism is by blocking the activity of thyroid hormone, which is so crucial, which we talked about in other sections. Absolutely. Uh, he carries on, and so with olive oil, which has a great high percentage of monounsaturated fatty acid, that has only a mild effect on blocking the cell response, the transport and the formation of the thyroid hormone. But linoleic, a major PUFA of seed oils, it has twice the blocking effect as the monounsaturated linolenic three times the effect. Fish oil four times, four to five times, sorry, the anti-thyroid effect. And so that's an example of what I was talking about earlier. From his perspective, fish oil is actually worse for you even than seed oil because of that effect of uh, blocking thyroid and slowing down metabolism. He carries on to say, and that's only looking at one hormonal system. When you look at the enzymes involved in making progesterone, for example, the enzymes are blocked in proportion to the number of double bonds. Yeah, we'll talk about progesterone in another section, but progesterone is something like thyroid that Ray Pete very highly prized. Um, and in fact, it's what he did a lot of his work on as a professor, is my understanding. And so thyroid is an amazing, uh, uh, you know, progesterone is an amazing thing as is thyroid. And if you have suboptimal levels of it, it creates a chain reaction of a lot of other things going on, going wrong. And again, we see that high levels of unsaturated fats will block that as well. And it's actually only the tip of the iceberg. You know, it, one of the other things that it does is create um, uh, inflammation and that inflammatory response sets up a whole cascade of other things going wrong because once the immune system, which is the thing that causes inflammation, is not operating correctly, then all kinds of other uh, things can go wrong. Our ability to deal with poisons and toxins and all the rest of it in the environment will go down. Our ability to deal with things that might not otherwise be allergens will be much worse, right? Suddenly we get all these allergies and intolerances. Um, our body's ability to deal with actual poisons like heavy metals and mycotoxins goes down. And so there's a huge train reaction to the polyunsaturated fatty acids. It's, I would say, hormonal and immune system being you know, both crucially important and, you know, probably only the tip of the iceberg. Let me t uh, comment on the issue of omega threes because I know that's uh, the most controversial aspect of this. How, if what he's saying is true, then why are the, all these studies, and they include studies that we, you know, show in our genetic insights reports that DHEA, sorry, that DHA and the uh, EPA are helpful. And here's my understanding of it. If Dr. Pete is right, and I'm not 100% sure that he is, but if he is, the way that it could still be possible that a lot of these omega-3s are considered to be so beneficial in all these studies is because if you have a bunch of unsaturated fats floating around in your bloodstream, you know, floating around inside your cells, then it's better to have a higher ratio of omega-3 to omega-6. However, and I didn't include the quotes because they're really long, but Dr. Pete talks about like in a newborn baby, which in many ways has optimal health, it has no unsaturated fats. It has no EPA. It has no DHA. It has no, um, you know, arachidonic acid. It has no GLA. It has none of the, what are considered to be 
essential unsaturated fats. And yet it's very, very healthy. It's just fine. And it only starts getting those unsaturated fats. And in the diet from the mother or, or maybe, you know, directly depending if it's given formula or whatever. And so his point was the body seems to think that the baby would be better off without them in terms of it shields the child from the mother's unsaturated fats the whole time that it's gestating in the womb. All kinds of poisons and undesirable things actually make it through the placenta into the baby. And yet the body considers that important enough to make sure it keeps out and that none of it gets into the baby. And so if that's the case, is it really something that's essential? Again, I'm not 100% sure about this. I'm just not an expert in it. But it's a reasonable pr proposition to then say, huh, maybe we are actually fine without any omega-3s and omega-6s. But given the fact that in the last, you know, definitely 40 years, as Dr. Pete said in the quote, really, you know, going back 80 years, we've slowly been inundated with omega-6s in everything, you know, in all processed food and all fast food and all restaurant food in you know pretty much unless you're making it yourself from single ingredient things it's you're going to be full of omega-6s and so it's possible that in that case having a good ratio of omega-3s in relation to it would be better if we look at the so-called traditional diet up until very recently you know even the 1980s is really when it majorly switched but as he said the 40s is where it started if we looked at people's diets before that who had way less incidence of chronic disease than us the vast majority of their fat calories were coming from saturated fats. They had a lot of saturated fat, they had a lot of cholesterol, they had a little bit of omega-3, again, depending on the location. You know, people near the sea might have more from, from oily fish and stuff like that. But seed oils and seed consumption was barely a thing up until less than 100 years ago. And so that may be the explanation for it, that we're better off without either. But if we're going to have a bunch of omega-6, and even you and I, Chrissy, even if you and I make a pact that we're never going to eat another omega-6 again, we, our bodies will still be full of them from all those years where we were just eating whatever. It takes an excruciatingly long time to get them out of the body. The body's very bad at getting them out. So that could be an argument for why even now you might be better off having some fish oil or DHA supplement or whatever because it's good to balance that omega-3 to the omega-6. That's possible. So now we're going to move into hormones. Good topic. <laughs> Lots out there about them that we're discovering, or I'm discovering recently. So the, the line here is, hormone supplementation is required to reach normal levels just 50 years ago. Yeah, so this is an uh, interesting one because, of course, a lot of people are scared of hormone supplementation because of probably indoctrination from the medical community that that's you know a very dangerous thing and admittedly it can be there are certain hormones that if you take them willingly you're going to cause serious problems the most commonly known one of course being steroids which a lot of men abuse for various reasons that create serious issues for themselves serious health consequences often often premature aging and death so being a bit wary about hormone supplementation absolutely is valid but feeling like it's fundamentally anathema so one group of people who tends to be against it are the people who are, uh, as I said, mainstream medicine kind of followers. But another group is the kind of natural health people. A lot of them are against it because they want to do it naturally. And so one of the arguments against that, I would say, is that, um, and it's something in a quote we included in a previous section about thyroid, that until recently, we were probably all getting a bit of thyroid supplementation in our diet because we all... You know, with very few exceptions, very few cultures, you know, the vast majority of our ancestors were eating animal foods. We're often eating the whole animal. And so we would get some thyroid hormone from eating the whole animal. Now, if that's true for thyroid, it's probably also true for progesterone. It's probably true for testicles. There's a whole thing about like eating testicles. Um, you know, the, in, in the carnivore community recently and taking f testicle uh, glandular supplement. It's probably true for some of the adrenal chemicals like cortisol, like aldosterone. And so uh, it's probably even true for insulin, although I don't know, you know, the pancreas, people would consume the pancreas. So maybe to some degree, it's definitely true for some of the um, 
the thymus hormones. People, you know, the thymus gland was certainly very prized. And so this idea that hormone supplementation is a new thing in the last few decades or 100 years that our ancestors never used to do is probably nonsense. It's probably actually something that we did a lot, but with various degrees of awareness, right? Maybe in some cultures there was a, oh, this person's sick, let's give them thymus gland. Oh, this person, you know, seems to be wasting away, let's give them thyroid. Maybe there was that kind of level of understanding, or, but maybe it was just a lot of tradition and just do it without an understanding of exactly why they were doing it. We don't really know. But yeah, so this idea that, uh, first of all, it's not natural and has never been done before, I think is not true. Uh, second of all, the I, but I think the the other aspect because you know the quote says normal hormone levels just fifty years ago, so I think that's probably referring to testosterone more than anything, and so the reason why, but I think it's also true for thyroid, it's also true for progesterone, it may well be true for DHEA, it may well be true for pregnenolone. Why? I think the short answer to that is toxicity. So an example of that, as I say, the most famous one is testosterone. So why is testosterone so low? Well, one of the reasons might be of all the estrogens, the phytoestrogens, the xenoestrogens, the estrogens in the water, the estrogens in the plastic, the estrogens in the food. And so this is antagonistic to um, testosterone. And so this can shift us into an estrogenic state rather than a testosterone state. And that's why a person may benefit from adding in extra testosterone because it balances out that excess of estrogen. That's also why a person could benefit from adding progesterone because it could balance out that extra estrogen. Well, estrogen is not the only toxin. And so this could be a huge thing that I won't get into right now, but there are all kinds of toxins that profoundly mess with and damage and reduce are optimal levels of all kinds of hormones. Polyunsaturated fatty acids, large amounts of seed oil, and its effect on um, thyroid hormone is another one that we used uh, recently in a different section as an example of that. So one of the hormones that Dr. P focused on a lot, which is not generally focused on by many people other than you know his audience as much. So testosterone is big, estrogen and progesterone are pretty big as well as bioidentical hormones. But what about the mother of all, all hormones? Uh, well, at least all the uh, uh, adrenal and sex hormones, the steroid hormones, as they're called, and that's pregnenolone. And so pregnenolone is the master hormone that all the other hormones are made out of. And Dr. Pete had some very interesting things to say about pregnenolone. And Dr. Pete says, in the early 1950s, there were studies showing that pregnenolone is much better than cortisone or cortisol for the uses those have, anti-inflammatory and so on. But its role in the system makes it even better than progesterone. Progesterone cures essentially everything, trauma, all of the degenerative and stress-related diseases. Okay, so that is a hell of a claim or several claims there. <laughs> so first of all, um, the fact that pregnenolone is actually better as an anti-inflammatory than cortisol or cortisone, right? Which is still widely used for that purpose up until this date. When we say that people are using steroid anti-inflammatories, that's actually what we're talking about. Um, in fact, it's so common that, of course, the other type of anti-inflammatories are called NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory to distinguish them. So the fact that pregnenolone could use work better than cortisol is quite a big thing given that very high doses of pregnenolone seem to be much 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 safer than very high doses of cortisol uh, so that's interesting but probably the most interesting claim that he makes there is that progesterone cures essentially everything <laughs> um all of the degenerative and stress-related diseases well that's pretty much all of the ones that people suffer from these days um so that is a hell of a claim. But yeah, I'll let you carry on the quote, but I just wanted to highlight if that's true. Hmm, interesting, the implications that that might have. And again, this is not something that he, you know, was a casual enthusiast of. This is one of the main things that he studied and, and taught about progesterone and pregnant alone. It's definitely worth looking into deeper for sure. Yes, he carries on to say, and it's hormonally more powerful than pregnenolone. But pregnenolone has the same position in the system. When you take other hormones, the body's production of that hormone decreases. But in the case of progesterone and pregnenolone, those substances support the body's production of more up to their ability to make more. 
So this is another really important distinction because one of the other reasons why it's very strongly discouraged generally that people take hormone supplementation is because of the danger of downregulation of your own body's production. So that's one of the issues with testosterone. You start taking testosterone, your body stops making its own testosterone. Your, your testicles shrink, you stop producing sperm. If you stop taking the testosterone, it's hard to get your body to start making its own again. It's a whole thing. That's why testosterone is also sold as a prescription drug that has to be supervised by a medical doctor. Now, at least in the US, both pregnenolone and progesterone are not sold as a prescription drug. And I believe this is the main reason why, because it's completely safe to take them in the sense that your body's not going to downregulate its own production. And also in the sense that it's pretty difficult to overdose on them. Testosterone is also something you can very easily overdose on. Hell, even thyroid, which we talked about before, is something you could actually very easily overdose on. And that's why I always do advise the medical supervision. But yeah, pregnenolone, progesterone. So just to take that, those two statements on face value for a second. So first of all, we said cures essentially everything. Then we said um, basically completely safe no harm in overdoing it, no harm in your body forgetting how to make its own. And in fact, the opposite he says that when you add them in, it actually helps your body to make its own in future. Yeah, no, this is really, really interesting. So I'll carry on with what he, he said. So if you're deficient in progesterone, sometimes a single dose or two can activate your body to return to normal production if you have the thyroid and cholesterol needed. And to a degree, the same situation with pregnenolone. It stabilizes the damaged mitochondria and makes it possible for your cells to organize energy production and more pregnenolone and progesterone production. Yeah, so the same thing again. He's saying um, that when you take these things it helps your body make it its own but also it's saying it helps your body to make that atp which again this is the key theme that runs through runs through ray pete's work is support the metabolism what does that mean support your body being able to make more atp more energy from the fuel that you give it so that's another reason why he was a, a big fan of these two molecules it carries on and the drug companies first realized that the progesterone and dhea were terrible drugs because they tend to cure diseases again a hell of a claim and again something that there's a lot of scientific data to back up um, I really recommend, you know, Googling Ray P. Progesterone, Googling Ray P. DHEA, reading some of his books, maybe reading some of the other books by people who, um, you know, are a part of his body of knowledge, as it were, and investigating the possibility that these things might be true, that these hormones are already in your body. If you give your body a bit more, it will start making even more of its own and that those hormones will provide a lot of benefit to every system of your body. Definitely worth looking at. Uh, it carries on. And the effects of pregnenolone, there are no recognized hormonal effects, but if you have enough of it in experiments, a rat, for example, would be given 10 grams per rat per dose of pregnenolone alone with no harmful effects except to stop stress hormone production. And so pregnenolone is a relatively expensive material if you supplement it adequately. Yeah, and so what he's saying about that is, so 10 grams of pregnenolone per rat. Um, what? So the pregnenolone supplements usually come in like 25, 50, 100 milligrams maybe. So the point that he was making is that as a human, you can take so much pregnenolone. So even though it's a very cheap supplement, if you were taking, I don't know what the equivalent of a rat to human would be in this case, but if you were taking like a kilo a day of pregnenolone, that would still end up being quite expensive. <laughs> Now, I'm not saying you should. No one's saying you should. Please don't do that. But the point is that it, based on the rat models, it may even be potentially safe to. That's how much you can have, and it'd be absolutely fine. Um, I would not do that. Um, I would be very careful with, you know, any hormone, despite what we said about the safety and all the rest of it, because you never know how your body's going to respond to it with whatever imbalances it's already got going on. Uh, but it's just interesting that from a medical point of view, you could give a vast amount uh, like they did to rats and you would probably be fine, but don't do that. 
<laughs> yeah, don't do that. <laughs> uh, he carries on. And since it isn't patentable, those three steroids are something that it's just a matter of the cost of producing them and marketing them. They could essentially cure most of the current, current diseases if they were made available massively and cheaply. But that doesn't interest the drug companies because they don't have patents. So there we're getting a bit conspiratorial, right? But there is a lot of evidence to support this perspective. And again, I don't encourage anyone to believe us or believe Ray P, but just look up uh, the benefits that these things have. Um, there is some misinformation in this regard, like progesterone. If you look up progesterone, you'll see like a lot of negative things attributed to it, but it's it seems like most of the negative things that are attributed to progesterone are actually um relating to synthetic progesterone which is not the same so when you're looking up all of these things especially progesterone you want to look at the bioidentical form that's not always made clear in the studies it is almost tempting to get a little bit conspiratorial when you look into this is he's right that it's literally the cure of most of the current diseases um and that the only reason that it's not used is because it's so cheap and not patentable I'll leave that up to you to decide. Yes, those are definitely worth looking into. Um, we will put the links to certain things down below so in the description, so definitely check them out for sure. Um, so we've got a few more to get through before we finish today. Another thing that Ray Pete is known for is healthy gut microbiome is nonsense. <laughs> yeah, so this is a massively controversial one. Um, and so how do I justify and explain this one? So where he's coming from with this is that when you have the more bacteria that you have in your, uh, digestive tract, the more they're going to create stuff, a lot of which is probably not beneficial for you. So endotoxin being the most voluminous and most famous one. Uh, but also another thing that these organisms create other than a bunch of other toxins is they also create, uh, neurotransmitters which can very strongly impact how we feel in a negative way especially if we have higher intestinal permeability also known as a leaky gut then more of those things can get into our bloodstream and it can affect how we feel and this has definitely been the case in my uh you know anecdotal experience so uh, as well as endotoxin the serotonin that's a big subject but serotonin can make you feel not good if you have an excess of it i think that's that's well known in the literature and um if we have certain bacteria in our gut that are creating that serotonin which a lot of them do and that gets into our bloodstream that can make us feel worse same for noradrenaline or norepinephrine that's something that is produced by many different bacteria that are commonly in the digestive tract that can make us feel more anxiety same for histamine that's another neurotransmitter that is commonly produced by the organisms in the gut that can lead us to have allergic reactions and other kind of histamine symptoms like uh, you know, a blocked nose and uh, um, swelling throat and red rashes on the skin and all the rest of it. So from Dr. Pete's perspective, my understanding is that it's better to just reduce all of that as much as possible on a practical level. So he was a big fan of antibiotics if necessary. And he was a big fan of especially antibiotics that work more in the gut bacteria rather than killing bacteria, maybe throughout the whole body. Uh, like I think rifaximin is an example of that kind of um, uh, uh, antibiotic, but I think he was more in favor of the uh, older antibiotics like monocycline and um, I think sulfur, some kind of sulfur one, I can't remember the name of it. Um, but anyway, like bottom line is less organisms, the better, was his perspective, just as he also believed less unsaturated fats, the better. Now, what about the idea that these organisms are creating uh, nutrients that our body actually needs or other compounds that our body actually needs? From his perspective, you can get all of that from diet if you're eating the right kind of diet. So you don't really need that. The other perspective would be is that they're always going to be there to some degree. You don't have to be afraid of knocking them back too much. You just want to knock them back as much as possible. He recommended certain things like a raw carrot, grated carrot salad diet. The idea of which was not to digest it, but to have it move through you uh, to work as an antibiotic and also as a fiber source. 
Uh, I think button mushrooms was another one that he considered to be a mild antibiotic. And there were a few things like that he recommended having on a daily basis. He has also recommended charcoal, which I'm a huge fan of recommending. Uh, it's not an antibiotic, but it is effective at mopping up many of the poisons that those um, uh, organisms create. But I would say his biggest focus of all in terms of reducing those organisms in the intestines was actually not feeding them. And so that's why he was uh, against starch. He was against a lot of um, forms of soluble fiber like beans and, and grains and stuff like that as well uh, because they feed those organisms. And so um, from his perspective, eating a diet that doesn't feed those organisms, that kills them liberally, um, and then just reduce them as much as possible and then also includes all the nutrients that you need was beneficial. Is he right about that? I don't know. But it's an interesting thing to consider. The, the idea that having a lot of organisms in your intestines is a good thing is a relatively recent one in the scientific community. And it's definitely not hard science and it's not been proven. Now, what has been shown many, many times with research is that by certain alterations in the microbiome, it can improve someone's health, right? Uh, fecal implants are an example of that, where adding in different bacteria makes a person much healthier than before. So of course, there is some validity to the idea that you're better off having some bacteria than others. You're better off having some pathogens than others. You're better off having some organisms than others. And there's also evidence that some organisms have a genuinely beneficial effect. However, could it be true that you're better off just having as little as possible of all of them? That's something that hasn't been fully investigated and hasn't been fully proven either way. But it was definitely Dr. Pete's perspective. You know, one of the things that feeds those organisms is especially soluble fiber from a you know normal point of view. And there is lots of evidence. I remember there was a whole book on it I read years ago called uh, The Fiber Menace that just, you know, uh, recounted study after study after study, basically showing that a lot of people got better of all kinds of health issues, especially digestive issues, when they reduced and even removed fiber altogether. So that would support the idea that just feeding those organisms less will resolve all kinds of health issues and all kinds of digestive issues. There is also the, the fact that, you know, probiotics are they're considered beneficial in many cases and not universally beneficial. There is no probiotic, whether it's a natural source like sauerkraut or kefir or whatever, or whether it's buying it, lactobacillus in a supplement, acidophilus or, or bifidum or whatever, that agrees with everyone. So with everyone, no matter how beneficial it's supposed to be, it could make them worse. And so it's an interesting idea that actually rather than trying to have the right balance and all the rest of it, let's just get rid of them. <laughs> like overall, they're not really helping us. Is it accurate? I don't know, but it's similar to the idea of you'd be better off with no saturate, unsaturated fats, right? And I think it may actually be similar to that in that if you have a bunch of unsaturated fats, that it's better to have a higher ratio of omega-3 to omega-6. And it may be similar that if you have a bunch of bacteria in your digestive tract, it's probably better to have some of the bifidum, some of the lactobacillus, you know, some of the bacteria deaths, etc. Like th there is a, such a thing as a better or worse microbiome, but maybe it's true that it's better to just have less microbiome than more altogether. That was uh, Dr. Pete's perspective. And another thing that Dr. Pete stated or is known for is uh, bloodletting is healthy. <laughs> yeah, so this is... Um, you know, very traditional medicine, I guess. <laughs> this is something that these days when we kind of make fun of the doctors from the past, it was the fact that, you know, they prescribed leeches for everything uh, or bloodletting for so many different issues. But there is a kind of truth to it. And it's especially for men more than women. But it's actually in general. So the kind of truth that applies more to men is that excess iron building up in the body absolutely does lead to a lot of different health issues. It is a... It acts as a free radical. It creates oxidative damage. It creates inflammation. There are certain health experts in the modern age who believe that it's one of the primary causes of ill health of all is this excess unbound iron. So there is that argument. The other argument is that there is just a lot of toxicity in the blood, especially if you're healthy. 
if you're less healthy, if you have a slower metabolism, then your body's going to put more of it into storage. But if your metabolism's raring and you're in a strong position overall, you're going to have a lot of toxicity circulating in your blood if there's any coming into your body in the first place for your liver to deal with and your kidneys to deal with and you know for you to hopefully excrete for your skin and, and all the other methods and so actually just removing a bunch of blood this is why it's been shown in studies that people who give blood regularly are actually healthy i think one of the reasons for that is removing the excess iron but one of the reasons for that as well you're just getting rid of a bunch of toxins and then your body's going to make all a bunch of blood to make up for that but if you don't have toxins in storage, it will make clean, pure blood that don't have those toxins. And if you do have toxins in storage, it will pull more out of storage, but at least then you reduce the amount that's in storage. And then if you keep doing that over and over again, you could be in a position where your blood gets cleaner and cleaner and purer and purer. This is so beneficial in so many ways. Every, you know, the blood is supplying oxygen and nutrients to pretty much almost every cell in the body. And so if that's not contaminated with a bunch of toxicity, um, because you've drained it all out, <laughs> if you drain more of it out, then that could be a really beneficial thing. So that's my understanding of where that theory comes from. And again, I think it has some validity. Is there any point, if somebody was very iron deficient, would bloodletting then potentially not be something recommended? Absolutely. That's why I use a lot of tentative language. And I think that really is the crucial aspect. If a person is low in iron, if a person is low in nutrition in general, they don't have the nutrients to make up the iron. One of the nutrients that Dr. Pete, of course, would be most focused on would be glucose, would be sugar. So if you're already really low on sugar. Um, but yeah, like, you know, all of the nutrients involved and copper and, um, you know, magnesium and, and all the rest of it. If you're very deficient, you should not be using bloodletting. But if your issue is more of excess, excess toxicity, not a deficiency in nutrients, then it makes more sense to me. This next one's a very interesting one that Dr. Pete is known for, and it is hard liquor is healthier than beer. <laughs> so as with many of the Dr. Peteisms, I have found this to absolutely be true more in practice, in reality. And then as a result of that, I've kind of looked into the theory of it. Um, beer is very estrogenic. And estrogen is not good. We're going to have to do that in a, another episode. Um, so that'll be a different section. Um, but excess estrogen is really not good to anyone. I guess the word excess would, you know, automatically imply that. But excess estrogen in this day and age is also ubiquitous for all kinds of reasons that we won't go into. And so beer is definitely increasing that estrogen. Uh, the hops in there are, you know, highly estrogenic. So I believe that is the main reason why he said that. The other reason, of course, is that there's yeast in there. So it's the product of fermentation. So it's also adding a bunch of organisms into your uh, system, potentially, depending on, you know, uh, how it's processed. Um, and it's definitely feeding potentially organisms like, uh, you know, yeast and, and, and fungi and stuff like that. I don't know how much Dr. Pete focused on that, but that's another thing that's pretty obvious to me um, is that, it definitely makes things like candida worse to be consuming beer because it's you know very yeasty anecdotally i used to when i was young too young you know go and drink regularly and i'd always drink beer because that's what everyone else is drinking and it always made me so sick i would literally vomit a lot of the time and it kind of put me off alcohol for a long time and then when i was in my 20s i would drink spirits um and I'd find I had a completely different response to them. And I realized it was actually probably the yeast and stuff and maybe the estrogenic effect that made me so sick. And it wasn't the alcohol. And when it was just the alcohol, which is highly refined and without any of that stuff, again, I mean, I still felt, you know, poisoned, like alcohol poisons you, but way less than you'd think, you know? So to me, six shots of a spirit could be okay, totally fine. Six pints of beer or whatever maybe six half pints of beer whatever is the you know alcoholic equivalent to that would be absolutely would wreck me so that's my personal experience as well so i 100 percent agree with this when people say they want to drink alcohol i recommend um you know spirits hard liquor over beer or wine wine has its own issues it's not as bad if it's real wine that's properly made it probably may possibly depending on circumstances be better than liquor but almost all wine actually has very few grapes in it's got lots of sulfites it's got lots of other chemicals in there to preserve it 
Um, and so therefore generally it's not beneficial as well. So I actually, if people want to drink alcohol, I would recommend hard liquor as number one, just like Dr. Pete, maybe for different reasons. And take your charcoal too. Uh, most definitely. <laughs> and we could probably dedicate a whole episode to all the things you could do with alcohol to mitigate the effects and minimize it. But there are a bunch of things that you can do um, to make alcohol a lot less damaging to you if you're going to do alcohol. Absolutely. It's not something that, oh, well, I'm doing it now. So therefore I'll also, you know, eat fast food or not drink water or whatever. Like there's a bunch of different strategies there's supplements herbs there's things you can do that w will significantly reduce the toxicity of alcohol let us know in the comments if you'd be interested in an episode on that this next one from dr pete is a little bit controversial when i read it so i was looking forward to your take on it <laughs> and your explanation and that is salads and vegetables are not health foods <laughs> yeah so uh, this is a man who says sugar is a superfood right <laughs> so um most salads and all the rest of it are pretty low in calories or glucose right they are pretty high in um, fiber and they will tend to feed the bacteria in your intestines and when you feed the bacteria in your intestines from dr pete's perspective that's not a good thing they produce more endotoxin they probably produce more serotonin and other things which are ultimately detrimental to you um, they're also difficult to suggest. I remember when I, uh, to, sorry, digest. I remember when I, my colonic hydrotherapist training, um, the colonic hydrotherapist teacher who'd been doing it for over 30 years, he basically said something similar to me. He said, all of that stuff goes straight through you, like you as in all of you. It's completely pointless eating it. That was from his perspective. Um, so, so that's another reason. But I, I included a Ray Pete quote that I think very quickly sums up what his issue with it was yes he says for example lettuce is if you eat it in a salad it's going to be an ideal bacteria food so if you have a tough intestine you can stand the growth of the bacteria but if you're at all prone to inflammation then lettuce or other undercooked vegetables are going to feed the bacteria that produce bowel inflammation and so overcooked vegetables are actually more nutritious than raw or partly cooked vegetables an experiment with rats showed that even rats can't live on raw vegetables as an exclusive diet that's interesting but they thrived on canned <laughs> vegetables that are overcooked which would be like the total Total opposite you think okay yes let's grab those fresh veggies or the tin the can that's been there and it's gonna be you know the expiry dates like four years from now it's a little out there yeah this is actually a controversy that goes back a long time I would say so if we look at say Chinese medicine going back a long time they would very much agree with this they were not keen on raw food they would consider it to be weakening the chi which is the equivalent of metabolism they would say it's hard to digest um, they would say it's low in nutrition. Now, where does the idea come from that any of these things are actually good for us in that case? Uh, because until recently, this was not mainstream, right? It, it's interesting when they look at, they don't have a huge amount of information on this, but when they look at what a lot of our ancestors ate, they noticed that a lot of them actually avoided vegetables at all cost. They, you know, vegetables, certainly including salad. They saw this as something that um, aggravated the system, like filled you up without giving you actual calories that you need. So it's like a filler. Um, they would consider it, yeah, like a, you know, a thing to eat instead of soil if you're literally starving to kind of make you feel full as opposed to actually something that's providing you with a lot of nutrition. So where does the idea come from that it's high in nutrition? Well, it does feed the microbiome. Whether that's a good idea or not, of course, is a contentious issue that we talked about we talked about Ray Pete's perspective on that in a different section. It does contain water, a high amount of water. Um, this is something that, you know, is potentially beneficial to get your water from that source. Um, it's not my favorite source, not Ray Pete's favorite source either. He was a huge fan of milk and orange juice. That was, you know, places where food sources that he would say would be a better source of getting hydration from. Um, it doesn't have a lot of calories. I don't think anyone would argue with that. So what does it have? Well, it has, you know, depending on what it is, some minerals, some vitamins, right? But if you compare, say, you know, the nutritional profile of 100 grams of grains 
versus beans versus well let's say a random grain a random bean a random piece of meat a random piece of dairy a random fruit the vegetable would have the lowest level overall of nutrients by far um and so i would say the why they came to be considered as beneficial is probably similar to the idea of why it it came to be considered beneficial to have a slow metabolism right like this is filler food it's not going to make you gain weight it's going to make you feel satiated and full it has certain plant compounds in there that were argued to be effective um, and actually good for you but i think that was actually secondary to the original impulse of just it being like a filler that would fill you up and provide water but without giving you calories because you're overweight and you want to lose weight don't you and you don't want calories so therefore just eat a bowl full of lettuce and and that will help you lose weight i think that was a lot of like how it actually became popularized um in the first place so yeah the idea that even rats can't do well on raw <laughs> vegetables is interesting i used to be a raw vegan for a, a couple of years so um i'm very familiar with that eating uncooked um plant food only and it is true it did wreak havoc in my digestion and it was not great in a lot of ways i would say for me personally though i understand every everyone is different um yeah so i think the feeding of the microbiome plus the lack of actual calories um is really the key elements of it as to why dr pete would say it's not healthy and these days, I have to say, from my practical experience, I would kind of agree with him. I, oh, yeah. So where does it come from? So other than that, like the more other than it just being filler that helps you lose weight, I think it comes from the idea of the, the electrical potential. So a lot of people might be screaming at me like right now, like, Elwin, that's nonsense. It's about energy, you know, and Dr. P was all about energy. So free electrons, especially. So it's true that if you take like a, a living plant, let's say before you even cut it down or pluck it or whatever, and you measure the living electrical potential of it, it's got a lot. And then by the time you boil it for hours and leaving it in a tin can for two years, it's got none, right? And so from that point of view, they would say, well, look, you want to increase your energy. This is the, more of the Ayurvedic perspective, although actually they don't necessarily recommend a lot of raw food, but they do depending on your constitution, as they call it. Um, but this idea of uh, uh, sattva, uh, rajas, and tamas. So there's three different kind of modes in the universe, and that relates to foods. So tamas is like dead, old food. They were definitely against that. Rajas is more stimulating food, which can give you energy, but is also kind of just, like makes you overly um, agitated. That's more like spicy food, meat, stuff like that. And then sattva was like like the pure high energy food and that might be correlated more with you know like mild plant foods like like say salads um whether cooked or not and so i think that's where it comes from and so if you believe that if that's your fundamental perspective then it makes sense that you eat those kind of foods and you consider them health food the challenge is though that they are difficult to digest so i go back to my experience with the clonic hydrotherapist right a lot of the time they just go straight through you the only thing eating them the only thing getting any nutrient out of them is not you it's actually the uh, um, organisms inside you. So I understand both perspectives on that, but overall, I fall on the side of agreeing. I can't remember the last time I ate salad. Um, I don't find it to be something that's beneficial at all. And if I had it, I would have it for flavor. I would not have it because I consider it healthy. And I know we're coming down to our time now, Ellen. Um, so this has been really great. And I love that this is our uh, last Ray P quote of the day. And uh, it's very interesting. And so Dr. Pete is known for saying coffee, chocolate, sugar, ice cream are addictive because they're good for you. <laughs> yeah. No, that's, so, that's a statement. <laughs> it's a hell of a statement. And again, as a bit of a thing, he may be right. Um, and so I think this a lot of this is context dependent. As I mentioned earlier, when I talked about the thyroid and when I talked about sugar and when I talked about metabolism in different sections, what is optimal for you when your metabolism is going full throttle kind of ideal, which you can tell by having that kind of 98.5 um, temperature after eating or, you know, maybe 70, 80 ish resting heart rate after eating. If you're not at that level, then those things may not be as good for you. But I think Dr. Pete's perspective would be the reason you're drawn to them is because they're 
trying to help you get to that level. So by having coffee, coffee is a stimulant. It does increase metabolism, it increases it temporarily. He was a huge fan of coffee. I think we could do a whole thing about his perspective on coffee. He basically considered it so beneficial. It's like a vitamin. I think that's a direct quote from him. Um, it, it, you know, it provides energy from his perspective. It does a lot of different things. I won't go into it too much because, you know, we're talking about four different things and we want to keep this one quick. Um, so they speed up the metabolism. All of those things speed up the metabolism. It's interesting with ice cream that I've seen this in a bunch of different non rapey places as well. Like the curious um, paradox of ice cream and health where they've done a bunch of scientific studies where they try and control all the variables, but then some people eat ice cream and some don't. And they found that the ones who eat ice cream are consistently healthier and they can't understand why. They're thinking, you know, maybe it's because they're happier, right? And so therefore, that reduces their stress and so therefore they're you know healthier uh, but they don't really understand why it's the case now of course if dr pete is right the why it's the case is really obvious and this is good quality ice cream right it's providing saturated fat which from his point of view is the best type of fat um, it's providing cholesterol which is the building block for all those hormones which we talked about in previous sections which are really important it's providing sugar which, uh, you know, we've talked about that in a previous section about why he thinks that's a great idea. Providing some egg yolk, which has some, you know, nutrients in it, um, which you'd consider to be beneficial. Um, and then other than that, it's flavoring, right? Either fruit, which he was a big fan of, or maybe chocolate, which he's obviously a big fan of, coffee, which he was a big fan of. So I guess, uh, yeah, vanilla even. So it's a bunch of different things, all of which he would consider to be beneficial. Also, if you um, uh, consider it from the yeah from the perspective of metabolism, it will absolutely uh, speed up your metabolism in many cases to have a certain amount of ice cream. Now, of course, when people hear this, it's it's a very compelling thing to do. If your metabolism is slow and sluggish, and you start eating large amounts of ice cream, you will very likely gain weight. That is. A challenge which is not good for you it's not good for your health not good for your longevity and all the rest of it but is it possible that you could get to a place where your metabolism is humming so much that like a healthy version of ice cream at least one that you made yourself or something not you know a store-bought one full of chemicals um could actually be really good for you and that's why you really want them absolutely it's possible I like that as a solution. <laughs> I quite like that. <laughs> well, and this has been fantastic. I know there were a few more things that we didn't quite have time to put in this episode. So, you know, maybe we'll be able to do that in the latter one because there's some topics that we can spend a good deal of time on as we dive into them. So, so thank you for this list. Before we close, are there any final thoughts that you want to leave us with? Yeah, I want to thank the uh, Twitter user that will link below for inspiring this by succinctly um, creating all the little uh, tweet snippets that we used in today's episode. We'll make sure to give them credit. I want to thank uh, Dr. AP for the work that he's done of just questioning things, right or wrong, right? Maybe he's wrong about sugar, maybe he's wrong about a lot of things. But the fact that he was willing to question all of this dogma from first principles, I think shows a kind of you know curiosity and a willingness to be open, which is very, very admirable. And the fact that he was willing to, you know, speak up and say it despite having this university professor position, which, um, you know, made it more difficult to do that. And despite, you know, all of the massive resistance he had. And as I said, there are many things that he promoted and promulgated back when no one was saying it. I mean, these days there are people obviously saying that bioidentical progesterone is a good thing or that seed oils are a bad thing but when he first started teaching it almost no one was saying it so i really appreciate his effort to bring to light some of these important things and for those watching i do highly uh, recommend that you look into his work um and you know at least consider the potential validity of it and i hope that today's episode has helped you to do that if you have experience with his work already and trying what he's recommended and it's gone well for you or if it hasn't because as i said it, you can easily go wrong with his advice if you if you're not doing it maybe in the right order or whatever then i'd love to hear from you let us know in the comments and thank you chrissy for uh and i'm sorry for the amount i made you 
have to read out <laughs> <laughs> and without editing any of it because a lot of these were just transcripts where they're not very uh, well put together so I think you did a brilliant job with it. Well thank you and thank you everyone for joining us today please remember to hit the like and subscribe button and the bell icon so you don't miss an episode and we can't wait to bring you more episodes that you're interested in so let us know if there's anything you'd like us to dive into. Take care and we will see you again next time. I hope you enjoyed that episode and if you did I want to tell you about a way that you can support the podcast while also getting great deals on high quality supplements that Ellen and I personally use, and that's Feel Younger. What I love about Feel Younger is that they have great quality products with minimal fillers at a very affordable price. You can call their customer support team 20 hours a day, seven days a week, and in my experience, they're very helpful and friendly. And the thing I love most of all is the amazing descriptions that Elwin has written about each product category on that topic. And each product has so much education on it that I've actually learned more from reading the descriptions than I have from a lot of articles. So to support the podcast, please use Feel Younger for all your supplement needs. And to let them know we sent you, use promo code RejuvenateMe for 20% off your first order at feelyounger.net. That's 20% off your first order using promo code RejuvenateMe at Feel younger.net hey i hope you enjoyed that video you may have noticed i recommended a few different videos in that episode and one of the ones i recommend is just here if you want to click there or another one i recommend is just below if you want to click on that one and watch that next